All right, so Mr. Brendan Teague. So Brendan, let's start off with uh, your history. So why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, how you came to be, and then of course, you know, end that piece with what are you doing now? What's your role? What's your title? Yeah. Yeah, how I came to be is probably a story for, uh, you know, that I'm not sure my parents would like me to tell on recording. Uh, but I think the, you know, in this business, I started in June of 2004 um, in Nashville, Tennessee. So I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. I bounced around a little bit, randomly had found myself in Nashville. Did the career builder click that a lot of us have done at some point, you know, submitted a lot of resumes, had no idea who was calling me back. Did the first round interview, was very intimidated by a fellow named Daniel Kim, Jamie. So that's whose office I started in. Went out for a full day in the field with my leader, James Pope, and, uh, you know, had a great day with James. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, you know, he said, if, if you got proper training, do you think you could do everything you saw today as good as, if not better than me? And I asked him, I said, well, did we sell anything today? And he said, no. I'm like, well, well yeah, I can do that. <laughs> um, and then I was very confident I was not getting the job from there. So <laughs> despite that, I got called back, started the next week. A few months into the business, I had a chance to move down to Atlanta to pilot our first retail program back with Singular Wireless and you know, the new AT&T back then. So we were selling Bell South DSL and home phone and direct TV out of AT&T stores. That took off. I was part of an expansion team, moved up to Louisville. I got promoted to assistant manager there, ran an office there for a couple of years, promoted a couple of people. Uh, moved back to Atlanta on a retrain and then left our business entirely for a little while. So dipped my toes into some consulting, did some restaurant consulting, you know, where you know, I was a big fan of the restaurant business and had spent a lot of time in it. Saw a big opportunity to teach a lot of the things that I had learned uh, in this business in that same environment. And, you know, was doing that when I was at James's bachelor party and he was asking me what I was working on. I had all these development things that I was really interested in coaching programs. And it's like, you should really talk to Sidcor about what you're doing. It's sort of heading in that direction because many moons ago, you know, back when Tony and Bo were and, and Hashan were just wee babes, Sidcor really didn't, a call like this would have probably have never happened, right? Of a, a Sidcor employee focus on, you know, kind of field development and all the things that happen in the field and how do we really grow and level up the field. Sidcor was, hey, deal with the client, deal with the payments, let the, and let the field be the field. And I've always been obsessed with personal development, professional development and growth. And I was building these programs, talked with Brandy Park for quite some time, ended up on the phone with Vera, ended up then on the phone with Bobby Park. Uh, the Quill program at the time was in a tough spot. You know, Jamie, I don't know if you remember, but the two, the LOD had just been changed to two years. And, you know, the campaign was uh, not in a happy place. And so, you know, that was my mission when I first started. So after talking with Vera and Bobby for quite some time, it was, hey, we know this program can be something big. We've done pretty well with it before. We're not in a great place. We need to figure out how to build this thing back into the powerhouse we think it can be. And so I ended up moving to Chicago and, and living at Quill's headquarters for a little while. They gave me an office at one point because I was annoying everybody there by, by working out of their offices. Uh, and we built that into, you know, a $35 million a year program uh, from that spot. And, you know, got a chance to spend a bunch of time working with the T-Mobile folks after that. And these last couple of years, I've had a chance to really build out a role that hasn't existed before taking some fundamentals of learning and development and sales enablement, which are big, big things, especially outside of our business and applying a lot of those concepts internally. How do we really dig into what top performance looks like? What high performance looks like? What great coaching looks like inside and outside of our business and map that into how do we do that more effectively with our leaders? How do we do that more effectively with our owners, with our promoting owners, with our consultants? So I've had a chance to play with BBB a little bit. I've had a chance to play with all the national conferences and keys to success and you know, really work on injecting some fundamentals about 
adult learning theory and how people learn and consume information and to saying, how do we take all these great resources outside of our business and translate them really effectively into our business and take all the great things that we have that are so special, bring in all these special things from outside and really create something amazing from a program, from a people and from a profit perspective. That's great. I mean, I mean, we need somebody in that role. I would, I would just, I mean, I'm just trying to think of, okay, we, if we didn't, don't have somebody in that role, it really sounds like we're missing out on, again, integrating all this great information from outside the business. When, when I think of the outsiders that have come in, I mean, Franklin Covey comes into our business and rocks oh. the world. Ken Blanchard comes in with DISC and situational leadership and rocks our world. So, you know, how to win friends. So you got to bring that stuff in from the outside because those courses, it's almost like they were written for us. So a million percent. Yeah. So, so how do you, I mean, you're just constantly getting educated, I'm assuming, and sign up for classes, going to, you know, sign up for webinars. I mean, always looking for the next thing, I'm assuming. Always. Uh, reading a ton, going to things. I I've taught at a few different conferences outside of our business now, and you have know, been working on that muscle of, all right, can I teach this also to, you know, not our people and, and, and kind of go back to that thread that is there, whether it's Blanchard or Covey or crucial conversations or, you know, Dale Carnegie. I mean, the thread is human beings. Hmm. Our whole business is human beings. Our whole livelihood is based on our ability to connect with human beings. And so, again, when I think about that, it's like, well, it would be silly for us not to pull in thousands of years of, you know, again, Ryan Holiday's Daily Stoic stuff. There's nothing new in there when he talks about controllables versus uncontrollables. OK, well, Seneca was talking about that 2,600 years ago. So I, I'm constantly excited to say, here's this great principle that's persisted through time. Now, what's a modern application of that principle into where we are at a particular moment in somebody's business? How do we actually take the principle and translate it into action into the, and into strategy and into tactics that ultimately we can keep building from? Yeah, awesome. Well, to get in the meat and potatoes here, I want to I want to share my screen. And so. This probably looks familiar here, Mr. Teague. I mean, you put some work into this. Now, I remember, you know, COVID happens and the, the swear word came up. I remember the first time I heard the words social distancing. I'm like, oh, that's like, it couldn't get any worse than that for our business. We're social creatures that want close proximity. We don't want distancing. Like, forget about that. And so you did your due diligence as you're studying the ICLs that were Coming out of the, as we're, you know, hey guys, you can now go back into work. This is now June of, I think it was like June of 2020, one campaign at a time started coming back to work after that little three month hiatus. And some campaigns like in Canada, it was like a year and a half that these guys were sidelined. I mean, it was unbelievable, but you did your, your studying and you're like, oh, listen, there's five things, you know, five core concepts that you found, you know, consistent with the high performers and so I'll stop sharing screen now. I'm just curious, like, as you're still doing that, I mean, mm -hmm. I know we're out in COVID lockdowns, even though right. there's rumors of like, put your masks back on and the shut, but I don't think that's going to happen, but we'll see what happens. Um, but so what are you seeing today? What are you seeing are the common behaviors, the common practices with the, you know, the Uber high performers, whether it's retail, mm -hmm. residential, B2B, on the reverse of that, what are you seeing are the commonalities of the offices that are really struggling or not promoting? So go ahead and sort of take it away. Yeah. We're just curious what you're studying, what you're seeing. Yeah. And and it was an interesting, again, I think the, the amazing thing to me about COVID was the forced opportunity it created. You know, and, and I think what, what was so interesting is the, kind of the quote about how, you know, character isn't developed by hard times it's revealed sort of sort of thing i think a lot of habits and execution were revealed by that change of environment 
right? So I think one of the things that's always been amazing and powerful to me about what we do is the transferability of skill. Right? Everything we do in, in the field and everything we do with customers is applicable to how we interact with people on our team, applicable to how we interact with our family, you know, at some point kids, all of these sorts of things. It's really all just the same stuff in figuring out where that through line is and how do I apply it in different environments. And so unsurprisingly, a lot of the people who were high performers in the normal world quickly became high performers in the non-normal world and then back to normal where it became high, you know, sustained high performance. And so again, I think that's it's a frustrating truth for most of us. And, you know, I don't know about you all, Bo, have you ever gotten the advice of uh, you should just get back to basics? At least. Yeah. Once. Oh, Steven yeah. Ever got, Steven ever gotten that advice? Right. Tony's gotten it. Who has enjoyed getting that advice? <laughs> right. Who has been frustrated when you receive that advice? Uh-huh. Tony knows, right? I'm like, oh. And so I think, so I think one of the most amazing things about high, about high performance is how simple and so how frustrating it is. And I mean, on that sheet you were sharing, the very first principle is, was prepare. I'm, I don't know about you all, but be prepared has been the second habit, you know, or third habit in my brain for the last 20 years. <laughs> so, and again, it's like, whether it's, Cup Scouts and Boy Scouts, or whether it's going back 3,000 years of like, this is a new knowledge to say, when you're prepared, you're likely to be more successful and more confident and all those things. Doing it, there's the challenge. And then doing it consistently, oh boy, even worse. And so I was, you know, sharing with somebody the other day that in my mind, how I've sort of, a lot of the reading I've done about habits is less about time frames and everything else and more about how do we really understand the roots of habits? So good habits in my mind are two things. They're acts of creation and they require effort, which makes them infinitely frustrating, right? Because you don't get to just do them once. You don't get to do push-ups one day and be set. You don't get to eat healthy one day and be set. You don't, you have to keep doing it and it requires effort and creation is so much harder than its inverse, which are bad habits, which to me are defined by destruction and negligence, right? It's really easy to break stuff and it's really easy to not do stuff, right? Like I can magically make everybody here not work out not hard to influence people to not do something right that that requires effort and so again when i look at the challenge of high mid and low performers the first challenge is this willingness to show up for the creative aspect and the effort aspect day after day week after week year after year so hard I think acknowledging it's it's hard is also okay. I think we get I think we mess ourselves up with that sometimes. That being consistently prepared is really difficult to do consistently, right? Again, the act is simple. The execution and consistent execution not nearly as easy as we would want it to be. And so I think Jamie when I look at the the spread across the business, a lot of times in my mind it's that consistency into those various habits. The second thing that gets a lot of people in trouble that I've seen across the board with underperformers and have demonstrated effectively to my own coaches at different points was doing things in name versus doing them in deed. I love that. That's, that's the exact face I was hoping to get. What do you guys think I mean by that? So Steven, Tony, Deshaun, what do you guys think? Like when I say a challenge for a lot of people is doing something in name, and not doing it indeed. All right, you're on mute, Tony, but I know this is good. No, I'm just uh, re-going it over in my head. Give me, a, give me a second. 
Okay. What do you think, Bill? I would say something where, you know, you might hear a manager say that they're spending a lot of time working on their recruiting, but mm. they're actually not recruiting. So they're working on it in name, but they're not actually doing the deed of recruiting. And even a step further, if you know you're going to have a call with uh, Jamie about your recruiting, do you want to disappoint Jamie? No. No. What is it that Jamie wants? If you're supposed to be working on your recruiting, what is it that you want to be able to tell Jamie? Numbers that look good, hopefully. <laughs> that I'm working on my recruiting. Yeah. Now, if your motivation is to get Jamie off your back and not get in trouble, what is your true intent? Is your true intent to recruit to the best of your ability? Or is your true intent to not get in trouble? Not get in trouble. What happens to the quality of work when we do the work to not get in trouble? It'll be good for a short period of time if that's it. And then it'll go to crap after. Oh, or it's crappy all along. He didn't do it for you. Yeah. You didn't do it for the reason. You, know, you didn't do it for the sake of excellence in the deed. You did it to say you did it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, yep. Yep. I'm hitting the field four days a week. Yep, 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 yep. Right? I think we've all said some of those things because we know it's expected of us. Underperformers do this constantly. Right? They share maybe a piece of what's going on, but leave the rest under the surface. Right. Of like in that sense of, yep, I'm hitting the field. OK, when you're in the field. How focused are you? How much are you on your phone? How much are you on conference calls? How much are you checking your email? How much are you doing these other things that tie into another you know, outside of the business learning, Jamie, you know, growth mindset by Carol Dweck? If you're constantly busy while you're doing the thing you're supposed to be doing, you give yourself an out for doing poorly. Yeah, I didn't cross the field today, but man, I, just, I had so many calls. I was so distracted all day long. Gives my ego an out if I don't do it to the best of my ability. If I do it to the best of my ability and I lose that day, that's a real tough ego blow. If I don't give it my best, I can, yeah, well, I, I, I didn't prepare for my morning meeting this morning. That's why it wasn't so sharp. Okay, well, what would happen if you prepared and it still didn't land? Oh, that might be harder. To, it's a harder pill to swallow. But top performers swallow that pill consistently. They, they do the deed for the sake of doing the best possible they can in that particular deed. And they're not particularly worried about getting in trouble. Again, when, it's, when you get into this sense of how are you running your business? Are you running it? to build the best possible business you are capable of running? Or are you running it because you know you have a call that's going to be coming up and you're going to have to just describe it? Now, normally, again, that's a it's a very sensitive place to be because ideally all of us are giving our best at any particular moment. But reality, at least for me, has been at different points in running my business. I was saying what I thought my coaches would want to hear. So I, so I would get the approval that I thought I needed and then be able to go back to not doing my best. So again, I think when I, like a, a great example, I think of this morning, I was in Nicole Scovegard's uh, virtual Zoom. If you all haven't sat in on Nicole, Revy, Taylor, that whole combo for virtual Zoom, I highly recommend it. If you run virtual and you haven't sought out who runs the best virtual atmosphere, classic underperformer mistake. Zoom made learning so much easier and copying so much easier. I can watch anybody who's doing Zoom. I can observe their morning atmosphere. I can observe how they operate breakout rooms. I can observe their leaders meeting. I can observe how they set up their days. I can observe how they're doing one-on-ones. The ability to observe just blew up phenomenally over the last couple of years. So 
So again, a top performer says, okay, what are all these people doing? They ask, they say, hey, can I just sit in and see what's going on? Take a bunch of notes from somebody like Nicole, who's like next level with the preparation when it comes to how their morning is running. Runs t on time with 60 people in the Zoom into seven different breakouts. People go where they're going. It's just like, all right, this is controlled chaos that clearly runs really smoothly. You can't do that without a lot of preparation. You also can't do that with a, a lot without a lot of mistakes to get to that point. So again, that willingness to say, okay, I'm going to iterate on this thing and continue to improve this thing consistently shows up with the top performers. I'm, I'm going to have to be bad before I'm good. Yeah, which we learned in the field. That's how LOAs work. It's like, okay, I'm going to build the, if I have the will, the skill will come. Same thing again with all the different areas if we're examining our business, right? If, if I'm putting in the will and I'm getting great coaching and I'm observing how other people are executing, I can work that into my own game, be willing to be bad at it for a little while, get coaching on that, and then continue to improve it. One of the scariest things I did over the course of a lot of these projects, and so I was building an entire performance management framework. I recorded my one-on-ones and then sent my game film to Rich Mangathis and said, hey, here's here are my, you know, so got permission from the people I was working with. Hey, do you mind if I record these? I'm sharing them. I need, I want to get better at how, how I coach performance in these one-on-ones. Yeah, sure. So I recorded all my one-on-ones, would send the game film to Rich, and then we'd watch the game film together. And it was brutal. Right? So the same way if you hear your own voice, you're like, ah, oh, is that really how I sound? I mean, it's 10 times worse on Zoom. Ah, oh, is that really how I look? Is that how I sound? Is that all, all of the stuff? But by the fourth one of those, my speed of improvement changed dramatically because I wasn't telling him, hey, here's how I'm having my one-on-ones. I was showing him, here's my one-on-one. -on -one. Get some feedback on that. All right, next round. Let me go do that. No, oh, you just froze. Anybody want to sell Brendan internet when this call's done? Oh, Whew. hey, so Brendan, quick question. I, I know we're almost at time, but you're bringing up yeah. you're bringing up something real good here, and it's reminding me of a convo I just had with my with my son. Yeah, um, obviously, it requires an enormous amount of initiative and maybe it's not enormous but you're taking initiative you're like hey listen i want to study the tape with you rich let's look at the tape or hey nicole i want to observe what a killer zoom atmosphere looks like and so so again when people are curious they take initiative they're going to learn um what's the cause of a lack of initiative if somebody's really let's say somebody's underperforming or they could be doing better let's just say they're doing good but they could be doing great what do you think is the root of the lack of initiative? Gosh, what a tough question. The things I think about when I have been in that when I have been in that position at least, where one of them is fear. Right? I think a big part of me it was it was it was limitation by fear. Gosh, what if they find out I'm not that great? That's a scary thing to kind of confront. There's a piece of ego in there again, where it's just like the willingness to admit that I'm not as good as I am capable of being. Well, that kind of takes some of the fear out of it. If I say, well, I'm not as good as I am capable of being. Can this person help me be better? And taking it from win loss. And I know, you know, Gareth is a big fan of the infinite game and that, that sort of premise of taking it out of the win loss paradigm and moving it into the improvement paradigm. I think that win-loss stops a lot of people in their tracks. I think something else I think that got in my way significantly, again, I was a terrible person to coach for some time because I was like 70 to 80% honest with my coaches. I would give them most of the stuff, most of the head stuff, very little of the heart stuff which resulted in a lot of the coaching I was receiving being 70 to 80% accurate. 
which then led to me being a little bit disillusioned in the quality of my coaches. Saying, well, they're just not really not really coaching me that well. And it was it's a lot it was a lot easier for me then to blame that and shut that out and say, okay, I got to focus on here. It's, there's no value in me reaching out. I'm going to keep being told, yeah, no, you're doing all the right things. Just keep doing it. When in reality, I was getting that coaching because the quality of coaching I was receiving was dependent on the quality of information I was giving. I, so who was I to expect great coaching when I wasn't giving good information? So that was a big obstacle for me to overcome to say, okay, I have to really give a full picture. Again, it's like get a personal trainer and they're like, okay, you want six pack abs? Okay, we're going to do this, but really your diet's going to be important. What are you eating? Oh no, I eat pretty healthy. And if I don't tell them that I'm eating a large Papa John's pizza three times a week, I'm going to think my personal trainer doesn't know how to coach me. Rather than acknowledging, oh, wait, ah, shoot, that was me. That They're giving me all the great stuff. I'm just not giving them the whole picture. So I think that can do it, Jamie. I think the other part, what's interesting that has helped me too is one of the best, my favorite, probably my favorite part of our whole business and the unique thing I think in our business is how many people are so excited to help, not just grudgingly will accept, yeah, okay, I guess you can. It's the eagerness to say, oh, you want to improve? <laughs> okay, let's do something with that. That to me is an, such an unbelievable privilege. And I think top performers recognize that privilege. If they say, you know, this is pretty special. I have access to some really intelligent, successful people who are willing not only just to give me 20 minutes, but to really pour some effort and energy into me. And again, that can also be intimidating if you're in the middle. Have I earned that? Do I deserve that? I don't know. They're really busy. They probably got other people they want to talk to. They might not want to talk to me until I perform. Sean, I'm seeing the head nod, right? We get like we get so into our own head that we cut ourselves off from even asking. And so again, I think a lot of it is related to the field of like that customer for the retail folks when the person's walking by and you know you see the new person that's like huh? Huh? and they're like not quite willing to to get past the butterfly part into that uncomfortable part but like for the guys who are like oh, getting in the house oh, i don't know and they back away from it there's so much discomfort in that willingness to expose that i'm not amazing and that i want and I, and I need help. That's a great perspective. Um, well, I appreciate that, uh, Brandon. I feel like we should probably get you on another call. 30 minutes doesn't seem to be enough, but we appreciate your, again, I mean, I think of the initiative that you're taking. I mean, I think we can all draw from that. Like, if you really want to level up, I mean, don't wait for the teachers to come knocking on your door. You got to go knocking on their door. So, totally. you know, that's that that's one of your strengths for sure. Yeah, no, I'm so grateful for the time. I'm I'm with you on all the different things. And again, if we want to get more narrow into some specific things, totally into that as well. If it's coaching or performance, all the different, you know, wherever we feel like there, where where is the frustration in the org? That to me is where there's a lot of magic that can happen. Yeah. Right. Of like, you know, what are the things we're just so frustrated with? Because that tells us, okay, we're at the edge of our current comfort zone. We're not as good as we think we can be or should be at this thing. Yeah. That's a great place to start digging into some improvement. Yeah. I love right. it. Again, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Brandon. We really okay. appreciate your time. See y'all soon. Thanks, Thanks sir. Guys.